Kevin to our webinar today. And um, this webinar is sponsored by the Research and Mathematics Education at Two-Year Colleges, the RMEDIC Committee of AMATIC. Um, one of the core values of AMATIC is to enhance personal growth for instructors. And so if these webinars are in that line of, uh, of attack. Uh, views presented by presenters are not necessarily the views of AMATIC, and if commercial products are mentioned, those are not endorsed by AMATIC. The webinars are all provided by the Lyft Institute at Muskegon Community College, who provides the platform. And if you have suggestions for future programs, um, please feel free to contact me at maria.anderson at muskegoncc.edu. And at this point, I'm going to shut off all of my stuff and... Um, Take me a second here. Stop sharing. Go to recently shared. Go to uh, Kevin's, and I'm going to shut off my webcam and turn it over to Kevin. All right, can everybody hear me? Everybody give me a group that can hear me? Perfect. Okay, well, first, thank you for everyone for coming, and thank you for to uh, Rheumatic and Amatic for the invitation. I must say, I was very excited to get this invitation. Uh, when I was at Arizona State University, I spent some time adjuncting at uh, Scottsdale Community College. And it was just a great experience, so I was definitely happy to get back and uh, hopefully talk a little bit about what I've done since that time uh, working for them out there in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. So today I'm going to be speaking on using angle measure to foster connections in trigonometry. Uh, a lot of this work was involved in my dis dissertation, and also I've brought it with me to the University of Georgia and been kind of extending the study I did with my dissertation. So I'm going to be speaking a little bit on both of these and uh, trying to talk about some of the work I've done with students and some of the instructional design that's uh, come about from that work. Uh, but to start things off, I'm going to just start off with an open response. So I have a question here. What does it mean for an angle to have a measure of one degree? So if uh, each person attending would go ahead and type in a response to the chat window and uh, hit enter and share it, uh, we'll go from there. So I'll kind of Give you guys a minute to take care of that. All right, so we got some responses up there. And as we can see, a lot of people probably could have used just a ditto. Uh, that each response here kind of uh, revolves around 1 360th of a circle or of a full circle. Now, what's interesting in giving this question to students that I've worked with both at the pre-calculus and pre-service secondary level is, here's some of the responses I've got from them. Uh, so we take a look here, we see, well, two lines are connected at one end, and one of these lines is slant, slanted away from the other by one degree. It means that the angle is very acute, one degree out of 180 degrees. goes on and, again, ties it to the idea of 180 degrees. Uh, now we do finally move into one that's 1 360th of a circle, but again, we see them defined in, kind of, in terms of a perceptual feature uh, that it's very small or that it's an acute angle. Uh, another student went on to say, again, that's acute. It's a very small angle. Uh, and then tried to tie it to a triangle of some sort and said, well, the sides would have to be very long. So within each of these responses, we see they kind of center around an acute angle, kind of talking about its perceptual features. Some connections to supplementary uh, angles of 180 or 179 degrees. Uh, some other responses get, it's not in the unit circle. Uh, so we're going to respond, trying to connect it to the unit circle by disconnecting it from the unit circle. And then actually another rather common response, particularly at the pre-calculus level, is something along the lines of, I'm not really sure what it means. Uh, so we see some confusion here that they're kind of hesitant on putting down a definition. Uh, another thing I want to point out is that these, these uh, descriptions they're giving are kind of all over the place a little bit as well as none of them really center on actually the structure of the measurement unit as you guys have centered in on, other than the one person that mentioned that it's 1 360th of a circle. Uh, all the other ones were kind of relating it to another degree measure or on like a perceptual feature of the angle or some connection to a geometric object. Uh, as Maria just pointed out, she uh, asked many of the students to explain what a radian is. Very often they all can't do that, and I'll speak a little bit on that as well. Uh, so if we take a look at surveying textbooks, it kind of helps explain some of their answers that they give. So a common approach to angle measure, uh, I'm not going to spoil the surprise of when this comes, but is along the following. Sometimes these are ordered a little differently, but typically each one of these is part of an approach to angle measure. We're going to talk about, well, first defining an angle and investigating angle in the context of shapes, so looking at squares, triangles, uh, objects like that, and saying, oh, there's four interior angles and so forth. 
classifying angles by their types, so the idea of acute, obtuse, ideas like that. Using a protractor to measure the angle. So here I stress the idea that they use a protractor to measure the angle. So the students are kind of, oh, here's this thing that measures angles. Now go to use it. Uh, and then from there, a lot of times they move into defining and calculating ideas of supplementary, complementary, adjacent, interior, and so forth with angles, where they're asked to, you know, given certain angle measures, calculate the other uh, supplementary angle, complementary angle stuff like that. Uh, so we can see kind of each of these within each of this these aspects of an approach to angle measure, we can see where these students' responses come from. Uh, that really with those responses shouldn't be unexpected based on what they see within uh, the curriculum that they go through. Now I'm going to kind of bring up a poll here and, uh, you know, talking about curriculum, well, we have, of course, the new Common Core State Standards coming out. So uh, Marie should have a poll that she can queue up that addresses during what grades do angle, degree measure, and radian measure first appear in the Common Core State Standards? So if each per person will choose a uh, answer, then I'll go ahead and broadcast the results. Okay, it looks like just about everyone now. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and broadcast the results. It looks like everyone's looking good. And, uh, so can everyone see the, res uh, the results there? Okay, perfect. So if we take a look, like, looks like some people had 3, 4, 6, and the other group had 2, 4, and then high school. Well, so what we see if we take a look at the Common Core State Standards as they are written right now, angles come up in grade 2, degree angle measure comes up in grade 4, and radian angle measure comes up in high school, uh, first within the functions portion of high school. So anybody that gave the answer, you can give yourself a round of applause. Uh, and I'm not sure if it was guessing or you knew it, but it's, what's interesting about this is, Okay, so they're given angles and they're asked for about two years to kind of reason about angles. Then they move into grade four and they're given okay, a definition or asked to at least reason about degree angle measures. But then they have this huge gap until they actually move into radiant angle, angle measures. So we're looking at anywhere from five to six to seven years for students that they're going to uh, they're going to be dealing with degree angle measure until they actually move into looking at what radiant angle measure is. Uh, so keep that in mind as we move through this talk today, and uh, maybe some of the implications of, that that might bring about, that there is this huge gap between the two. Now, what I love about it is looking at the actual approaches to degree measure that are within uh, common curricular approaches. And what I have up now is called a protractor posture. I'm not sure if anybody's heard of this or aware of this, but it's actually been picking up some ground, uh, Interestingly enough, at the high school level, that a lot of high school textbooks are starting to use this postulate to introduce degree measure. Uh, so rather than reading it word for word, I'll go ahead and let you take a look at it for, uh, read it over here for a couple, uh, couple seconds. So now what you see here is that it's kind of about rays, and we're going to take, you know, a line, and we're going to say, okay, that's our baseline. We're going to draw two rays on one side of that line. We're going to pair up those rays with a real number, and we're going to take the difference of that real number and we're going to get something we're going to call an angle measure. So the interesting thing I find here is, well, the focus is really on a way to calculate degree measure, or a, a degree measure as coming from a calculation. Uh, so really, the description doesn't really go into a description of what degree measure is, how it came about, you know, what the structure of the unit is. It's really, OK, here's a nice way we can calculate it by pairing up some rays, make, you know, find a difference, and now you have an angle measure. So a really interesting approach to degree angle measure that's actually picked up a lot of steam recently. Uh, as I said, it can be found in high school textbooks, uh, which we'll think is surprising or not later as we look, uh, as we move forward. So now, of course, radian measure. I haven't talked about that yet. So what I want each person to do is go ahead and write down a uh, definition for radian measure in the chat window and go ahead and hit enter and share it with the rest of the group. Okay, good. So I'll go ahead and uh, move forward. I think everybody looks like they're on the same page. So pretty common, you know, it looks like all the ideas are tying around. Well, an angle of measure one radius subtended by an arc of one radius. And often or not, we have the following diagram that goes al along with that uh, to kind of convey the idea that's there. And we see that the angle measure is determined by dividing the arc length cut off by the corresponding radius. Uh, so here we see a very, very common definition for radian measure where we don't quite see that with degree angle measure. You know, as I showed earlier with the protractor postulate, and that's just one of the many ways that degree angle measure is defined within 
uh, different curricula that's out there. But what the radiant measure, an interesting thing is, we move into it, and it's this very common definition. You open up just about any textbook, and you're going to get something that looks along these lines. Now, as Maria brought up earlier, though, when we typically ask students in the, at the both pre-calculus and pre-service level, as well as the research literature that's out there on angle measure, when students are asked to define an angle measure one radian, their most common response is converting it to a number of degrees and saying that's what an angle one radian is. It's so many degrees. Uh, where we think back on the, the responses I gave you previously when we we're talking about degree measure, not one single student defined it in terms of a radian angle measure. But yet, when the same students are asked to define radian measure, they often convert to degree measure to define it. So we really see this dominating uh, movement towards degree angle measure when we think towards the gap that exists between fourth and high school. Well, it should be surprising when they're going through so many experiences in degree angle measure that all of a sudden they're asked to think about something a little bit in a very different way uh, relative to the way they've been thinking about degree measure that they would somehow try to attach that new topic to something they're familiar with. OK, so what's the big deal? Uh, obviously, I mentioned this isn't a talk completely about angle measure, but I want to talk about uh, trigonometry. So what's the big deal? Why am I spending such an emphasis on angle measure? Well, the research literature out there shows that both students and teachers, which I'm sure is no surprise to anybody listening to this talk, really have difficulty reasoning about trigonometric functions. Uh, and a lot of literature out there shows that often these difficulties really stem from their understandings of topics foundational to trigonometry. So some of the available studies that are out there have shown that, for one, teachers are often tied to right triangles uh, when they're discussing trigonometric functions. And that even when they're asked to look at trigonometry in a little bit different of a way, they can't envision themselves teaching trigonometry without starting within right triangles. Now, Fee offered some insights on that in one of his studies that, that noted that, well, degree angle measure dominates student conceptions of angle measure, which in a, it makes sense then that their understanding of trigonometric functions would be dominated by right triangles, as it's within the right triangle context that we use degree angle measure, where it's within the unit circle context that we typically use radian angle measure. So we can see kind of an explanation there for why students might be tied to, and teachers might be tied to right triangles if their angle measure conceptions are dominated by uh, uh, degree angle measure. Uh, and I should note, too, uh, if anybody has any questions about the references or some of the stuff I'm going to be talking about, I'm going to kind of gloss over, feel free to email me after the talk, and I'll be happy to provide any of the references uh, that I mentioned in the talk. Now, extending some of the research literature on trigonometry, Weber noticed that students that he was working with were uh, unable to give meaningful explanations of sine as a function. So he asked them pretty frankly, why is the sine function a function? And what he noticed then when students were trying to answer questions about the sine function and cosine function and other trig functions was they really struggled to construct a geometric objects necessary to reason about these functions. So when asked to talk about the sine function, the students say, well, if you gave me a right triangle, I could tell you what it is. So they weren't able to spontaneously come up with these objects to kind of uh, support their answers. Additionally, other studies have shown that students define trig functions at positions as opposed to on the real numbers. So you can imagine looking at the unit circle, and a student will point at pi thirds and say sine is dot, dot, dot at pi thirds. So in this case, they're not imagining pi thirds necessarily as a number or as a measure, but a place on the unit circle. So when they move into a graph of the function, they, have, they encounter some difficulties. And also, uh, really interesting to note is students often view pi as a position or unit of measure, so similar to the previous description as a position. But also, the students say, well, angle measure and radians are given in pi's. So if it's 3 pi, well, the measure is 3 because I have 3 pi's. So they almost conceptualize pi as a unit rather than as a number, which if we think about how we often treat variables in a math classroom, well, we say if we have 3x, we have 3x's. Uh, it actually ends up being pretty compatible with that kind of uh, approach to variable and thinking about it as repeated addition of some uh, symbol. Uh, and also a previous study that I looked at, which I'll speak a little bit more on, is that student, students also view angle measures as labels of geometric objects as well and really lack a systematic process by which to measure an angle. And I'll speak a little bit more on this as we move forward. OK, so oh, the slide did not go forward. OK, there we go. Now, also complicating an issue, which is that a survey of the history of trigonometry and co common US curricular approaches 
to trigonometry have revealed that classroom approaches to angle measure and trigonometric functions stand in very stark contrast to the history of these topics. I believe David Purcell gave a, a, one of these webinars on this, or maybe a presentation at one of your conferences on this exact topic. Uh, so he did much more justice than I'm going to do to it today, but mentioned that for over 2,000 years, angle measure and trig functions were about circles and dealing with arcs and segments within circles. Then it was in about the 1800s that it flipped the right triangles, uh, being the predominant focus, which still exists in most of today's curricula. And then Thompson had recently wrote a really nice piece on uh, taking a look at the fundamental divide that's created by contrasting approaches to degree and radian measure. Even though both of these units measure the same quantity, uh, where he really focused on, uh, you know, we really need to be careful how we teach these topics because if we create uh, differences between degree and radian measure, well, then it's going to explain the differences we see with students between right triangles in the unit circle. So all this research kind of painted a really alarming picture to me. And of course, my advisor came along and kind of gave me that push-push, well, this is what you're going to study. So the response to this was designing an instructional sequence that was informed by both the research literature that's out there as well as the historical developments of these topics. Uh, where some of the additional research literature that I pulled on was looking at the idea of function and reasoning about you know, some of the important processes there, as well as quantitative reasoning in the sense of uh, students learning to model situations using mathematics and really having mathematics emerging from their own thinking and conceptualizations. And again, if you are interested in any of that research literature, I'd be happy to provide that. Uh, after the talk, just feel free to contact me. My email address will be on the last slide. Uh, in order to investigate this, I also use a series of teaching experiments to investigate student thinking during this instructional sequence. Uh, so to kind of gloss over a teaching experiment quickly, basically it's working close in a one-on-one -on -one or one-on-three setting with a group of students where I'm implementing tasks, trying to develop models of the student thinking, re designing new tasks based on how I think the students are thinking to kind of test their thinking, and then trying to achieve optimal progress in the students. Uh, where the progress isn't the main focus, it's identifying the ways of reasoning that lead to that progress for the students and what might inhibit their progress or help them overcome those uh, difficulties in their thinking. Uh, so today I'm going to be speaking a good bit on the instructional tasks and some of that research I've done with students, both at the pre-calculus and uh, pre-service secondary level, with an emphasis definitely being on the pre-calculus students that I've worked with. Okay, so now I'm going to move into the instructional sequence and in student work. And rather than kind of discuss the ways of reasoning I pushed within, uh, I was pushing with an, each instructional task that I was designing, I'm going to kind of hopefully let the student work kind of show the ways of reasoning that I was looking for. Uh, because a big emphasis of the class was to have all definitions, all formalisms emerge from the student thinking. So I'm going to hope that the data that I present does that uh, for the presentation as well. Of course, I could flat fall flat on my face with that, but hey, we'll see if that actually works out well. Uh, that way I don't give away the surprise. But I will provide some baseline information as we move forward. Um, so at the beginning of each of these studies, I conduct pre-interviews with the students. Uh, and these were the ones I was alluding to earlier with the stuff I've done in angle measure. Where what I've seen with students in these pre-interviews is typically that their angle measure understandings are very rooted in labels of geometric objects. So I tend to define one degree and I'll define it within the context of a straight line. Well, a straight line is 180 degrees, so I can assume it's 179 degrees less than that. Or they'll say, well, a circle is 360 degrees, or a right angle is 90 degrees. So they kind of attach angle measure to a, ge a specific geometric object. Then when they're given something like 31 degrees, they're kind of, well, I don't know, it looks something, and they'll draw an angle, something like that. Uh, so on the basis of that, I often ask them to measure an angle given a piece of wax string, a ruler, a compass, uh, and a calculator. So that I, I try to base to see if they can measure an angle using those supplies. And uh, most frequently, I'd say 99% of the time, the students are unable to do that. They kind of play around with the string. Maybe they construct a circle at the, around the vertex of the angle, but they're kind of stuck and say, well, I'm not really sure how to go about that. So that kind of, what that suggests is that they don't really have a systematic way, means by which to go about measuring angle without a pre-constructed tool like a protractor available to them. Interesting enough, though, when given a specific arc length on a problem, the students can typically calculate angle measures. So I'll give them a circle centered at the vertex of an angle with the arc length, arc length identified and measured, and they'll come up with a way using ratios to come up with a correct angle measure, but of, of more importance, 
they're unable to justify that ratio typically other than saying, well, maybe doing some unit cancellation, like I'm going to put degrees over degrees, feet over feet, I'll cancel the units, uh, and that'll get me to where I want to go. Uh, so they maybe do something like that, but they're unable to really talk about the ratios from a quantitative perspective about what each ratio would represent. Um, so that's pretty the typical outcomes in the pre-interviews of both pre-calculus and the pre-service teachers I've worked with over the last uh, four years or so. So in, in, in light of those findings, my initial goal typically when working with the students is creating a situation in which their conceptions of angle measure are brought to the forefront. So rather than ignoring the students' conceptions of you know, angles as objects or lacking a systematic way to measure an angle, I want to bring that to the forefront and kind of, ha and kind of bring about with the students where that's going to present difficulties and that, hey, that does present difficulties with the hopes that they'll then have to reconceptualize uh, you know, their idea of that topic. And then my overall goal is that after they've come to that realization, they will develop a systematic method for measuring an angle that involves coordinating quantities measures. And then from those actions, uh, within multiple contexts, they'll be able to develop common meanings for degree and rating angle measure uh, that emerge from their actions, where I'll speak on those common meanings here after we've taken a look at some student work uh, within some tasks. So one of the first tasks I use is what I call, I've called a protractor activity. Uh, so what they're done for this task is they're given a blank protractor because all students are familiar with the pre-constructed protractor. Uh, I give them a blank protractor and say, okay, well, we need to create a protractor so we can measure in angles. And rather than start with degrees, uh, I start with some fictitious units that I've just made up where I call them gifts and quips, uh, where I let eight gifts rotate a circle, so four for the half circle, and 15 quips rotate a circle, so seven and a half for the half circle. Uh, and they're set off using the blank protractor, a wiki stick, which again is just a piece of wax string. So when I'm using that word, that's all that is. Uh, just imagine taking a candle wick and coating it in wax. So it's real nice. It'll hold its shape as you bend it. And a roller in there also allow the calculator to make calculations on this. So now what's interesting about this task, and actually the way I designed the task is with the eight gifts, initially they can use kind of their vague notions of angle measure in terms of objects to reason about areas. So they say, well, I want four gifts. I'll fold the protractor in half. I'll fold it in half again. I'll get four equal pieces. Now I have what I want. So the students are pretty happy with that. It's a correct solution. They can draw on the rays from that to give the integer values for the ankle measures, and they're good to go. And I kind of let them go about that and say, OK, yeah, that's a you know, perfect, perfectly legitimate solution. That'll accomplish what we want. So now go on and try it for the, uh, the next one. So now here's what happens when they move forward then is, well, they try to think of folding again, but because it's seven and a half units, well, now they have difficulty folding the protractor. Uh, that just simply making consecutive folds won't give them what they're looking for uh, because obviously they go for the integer values of the angle measures and they don't really reason about fractional amount uh, for the angle measures. Uh, and so my choice on the 15 quips is, per, is very purposeful, and I expect that to come up. So the students are now presented with the difficulty. Well, if I'm thinking about angle measure as an area, all of a sudden I have some issues. I'm going to have to kind of rethink this problem. Uh, and so typically what then they think about the students, I kind of leave them to just kind of flounder and try to figure something out. They realize they haven't used the wiki stick for any purpose at all. Uh, they've asked about it in the previous when they are making the gifts, but like, oh, we don't need it. Uh, you know, maybe you're just trying to trick us and lead us astray. So what they typically do then is, well, they say, well, this thing bends. I can measure the arc along the protractor. And they'll identify this, so they'll measure along that, use their ruler to come up with a measure, and then partition the circumference of that protractor based on finding an arc length per quip. Uh, so, the, so as an example, they'll come up with something along the lines of, well, for circles of circumferences approximately 31.5 centimeters and 51 centimeters, they'll find arc lengths of approximately 2.1 centimeters and 3.4 centimeters per quip, respectively. And they'll use those lengths to iterate across this, uh, the arc of the protractor and mark off marks for each angle measure. I did forget to mention, too, that each student, when I do this task, is given a protractor of different size, and they're giving wiki sticks of different sizes during the project, during this activity. Uh, so they come up with different numbers when they move to this way of reasoning. So now this is, what this does is it makes a really nice discussion point with these students when they come up with a solution because they come up with two different arc lengths that correspond to one quip. Uh, so they're left, with, they're left with juggling, well, we're coming up with different lengths, but yet something about these lengths are remaining the same. 
And that can lead to a very strong discussion point with the students where I often then, this is where I'll often intervene and pose four different or three different ratios while I'll pose each arc length to the circumference. And you can imagine there could be 20 students in the class that are each going to have pretty much different arc lengths. So you can pose as many different ratios as you want. And then I'll pose the one quip to, uh, to 15 quips. And so the students, of course, rather than first interpreting what the ratios might represent, they, their initial goal or reaction is to, well, I'm going to calculate each ratio. And they'll come up with, well, we can say they're all equal. Uh, so often that'll perplex them a little bit. And then they'll, I refocus them on, well, let's just look at one of these ratios and what does it represent. And from that, the students will bring about, well, we look at ratios as a fractional amount of the denominator. So in the first case, 2.1 centimeters is some fractional amount of 31.5 centimeters. They'll come up with, well, each arc length is 1 15th of the circle's circumference. And that creates a basis for which we define with uh, angle measure that, well, if we have a measure of one quip, we're saying that that angle is subtended by an arc that's 1 15th of a circle's circumference. And uh, we use that as a basis for defining quip measure, which we then also uh, we apply to get measure. Then I ask them to go about and construct a, or to anticipate constructing a protractor in degrees and to come up with an explanation describing to someone else how they would go about to construct a protractor in degrees. And the nice thing about that is they have to think about each degree measure in terms of that unit degree. So it leads to this. Uh, unitizing effect where they're coming up with a unit and then thinking how they're going to iterate that unit to come up with each measure along the protractor. Uh, it creates a really nice basis to kind of move into formally defining uh, degree measure as well an angle measure of d degrees conveys that the angle is subtended by an arc that is d 360 is of the corresponding circle circumference. As each of you so uh, eloquently put at the beginning of the talk that you know this is the this is the definition of degree measure that we would like students to bring in, even though the research shows that they typically don't. Uh, so the beauty of this is a kind of a, this definition kind of emerges through their activity on the protractor task. So it's really developed this new way of looking at degrees for them that they're able to now jump onto and uh, hopefully carry forward. Uh, and so after this task, I obviously have them work on some other activities to get flexible with calculating angle measures given arc lengths, calculating arc lengths given angle measures, and they do some other activities uh, to kind of really uh, internalize this idea. Uh, but then we move into uh, rating measure from there. So for the next uh, response, true or false, uh, a rating measure is unitless. So if you want to use agree for true and disagree for false, uh, we'll go off of that. OK, it looks like we got some responses up there. We'll go ahead and broadcast these because I am running a little short on time. Uh, and so we can see that we're kind of divided. We're looking at, you know, five say it's true, three say it's false. And actually, that's a pretty, uh, asking pre calculus or pre-service teachers, it typically slants towards the true version. Now, I'm going to make some assumptions uh, here. Often, for the true response, well, the, the definition or the reason given, and that's the ratio of two lengths. So we looked at dividing an arc length by the radius, so we'd say something like three to 3.2 feet arc length, 2.1 feet the radius. You know, we do something like the following: cancel our units. Hey, we're at something that's unitless. Now, so the, the truth, saying this is a true statement, is more the artifact of the calculation used to make the measure. And in that sense, it's better phrased as dimensionless, because when we say something's 2.1 radians, we are carrying a unit with it. We're saying it's 2.1 radians, with the radian being the unit. Uh, so really, in a sense, this is dimensionless. For example, if I take a look at the two lengths at the bottom, I could say I want to measure that top length and the bottom length. Well, to do that, I would take the ratio or the multiplicative comparison of those two lengths, and I would come up with something like this. Well, the top one's 2.1 of the bottom one. Well, if I call that bottom one one foot, we really have the same thing that the radian measure is based on. We're taking a ratio of two lengths, but yet we're, we're not going to say two, you know, 2.1 foot divided by one foot doesn't have units, we're going to say, well, no, that's 2.1 feet. Uh, so it's not so much true that the uh, radian measure is unitless, just that it's dimensionless and that we can't point somewhere and say, hey, that's one radian at all times, like we can with one foot. You know, we have this, we have this established magnitude for a foot. For radian measure, we don't have that. It's based on the circle we're dealing with uh, and within that. So that's where the different structure is. But it is a unit because we're using it to make a measure. And we still have the same idea of 
partitioning uh, something into a unit. Okay, so the goal in moving into radian measure and instructional sequence was getting them to conceptualize the radius as a unit of measure. So that when we discuss radian measure, it wouldn't be thought of as unitless, but actually based on a certain unit, uh, a unit of a magnitude that varies. And kind of moving and connecting to degree measure, I want them to also develop a very systematic method for measuring an angle that involves co coordinating quantities measure, so measuring along an arc again. And I was hoping that common meanings for degree and radian angle measure would emerge from the student's action as they went through the task uh, I'm going to present here in a second. So the first task is a pretty common task. So it's probably no, of no surprise for the people that are, uh, for most of the people that are in here. But I had them construct circles of different wiki stick lengths uh, with each wiki stick as the radius, and then kind of determine how many wiki sticks go into each circumference. Then I also asked them to make uh, different angles that are subtended by different lengths. Uh, or different numbers of wiki sticks. And now each student was asked to do this with a radius different from the other students. And then they're asked to compare their results with their group members. So the typical outcome of this activity is, well, they come up with something that's the following, where they come up with uh, about six and a quarter radii rotate a circle, and they'll come, up with a di they'll come up with diagrams that look like the following. Well, typically a student will mention, well, this has something to do with 2 pi, which is 6.28. And we'll send that to, well, 2 pi radii rotate the circumference of any circle. So at this moment, I then ask them to say, OK, well, is that, is that like degree measure? Or is that you know, fundamentally different from degree measure? Uh, with the added caveat is, well, can we use the, ra the radius as a unit of angle measure? And this is where the students are often able to come up with a pretty spontaneous connection that, well, just like degree measure, we have a constant number that rotate a circle circumference. And just like degree measure, if I look at, let's say, one radian, that's always going to cut off the same fraction of the circle circumference, no matter which circle I use. Uh, so they come to the justification that, yeah, we can use this as a unit of angle measure. It holds those two properties. That's what we need. So we'll go along with that. Uh, so after they've come up with that, you know, we do some additional explorations. Uh, I'll move through this pretty quickly. I have the common definition up there. We'll move into some uh, different uh, geometry sketchpad applets, graphing calculator applets that move into a dynamic situation where, for example, with this activity, uh, you can change the radius of the circle here. You can also change the uh, measure of the angle or the openness of the angle. You can do those two things, and all the different measurements up here will vary accordingly. So I'll work with the students to kind of give a conjecture or a prediction and then verifying their prediction. So as I'm going to increase the open, openness of my angle, what's going to happen to each of the measures? Uh, so I'll do that to kind of move them into a dynamic setting to try to keep them thinking about radii or circles of different radii, but how even if you do change the radius of the circle, your angle measure uh, stays constant if you're not doing anything to the openness of the angle. Uh, so I'll use that to kind of try to keep a dynamic setting. Now, OK, so uh, I'm going to give a small piece of student uh, information here to kind of give an example of, uh, of some of the outcomes that typically come from these activities. So this was within a teaching experiment uh, setting where I moved the student outside of the class after the, one of the sessions and kind of just interviewed them on some tasks to kind of get an idea of where their thinking was. Uh, so the student's response to this was immediately after these activities uh, and this was done without any interview or intervention or questioning on my part in terms of trying to get him to learn. I'd ask him to explain his thinking, uh, but it wasn't asking him to learn. So take a minute to read the question, uh, then I'll kind of move forward to a student's solution. I actually have a poll before I do that. So you can read the question, and then Maria should be able to queue up a poll here where I would like you to predict what you think a typical student would do uh, on this problem. So not a student that's gone through what we just talked about, but just you know, your epistemic student that just is a general pre-calculus student. OK, so again, broadcast, broadcast the results. It looks like we're divided here on converting the radians and solve and then creating an equation between measures and degrees and inches. Uh, so to keep in mind that the, with the pre-interviews, I typically give a problem just like this with the students. And uh, they typically, predominantly, uh, don't use radian measure. I actually haven't seen one student yet, pre-service student or uh, pre-calculus student, first convert to radian measure to solve the problem uh, during the pre-interviews. They often create an equation using ratios, or they're unable to solve it. Uh, so now we'll take a look at a student that worked with me on the in the teaching experiment and kind of take a look at his solution. 
So you'll see here I have the student's work so that you can see it after he's completed it, where he's created the ratio and kind of solved from there uh, and came up with each proper arc length down the right side of the paper. Uh, and now this is this quote from the very beginning of the task. So this is right before he uh, right before he wrote down all of his work. So he said, what I plan on doing for this one is converting 35 degrees into radians. So those two should be equal. So he writes the first ratio there, 35 over 360 equals x over 2 pi. And I can just find x. And then with that, all I have to do is just multiply the answer by 2 inches, 2.4 inches, and 2.9 inches to get the different arc lengths right there, because radians is just a percentage of the radius. So we, hear, we see what's interesting here is, for one, the student's kind of anticipating the solution. So he's using relationships between measures and quantities to kind of predict what he's going to go about doing. And then what was really powerful here was, well, he used the idea of radians as just a percentage of the radius to kind of anticipate making a calculation and say, well, once I have the radian measure, I know that's, an, I know that's a percentage of the radius, and that holds for each arc length. So I can multiply by the corresponding radius. So we see pretty powerful reasoning here to come up with a solution. And now what I was really interested in also was his solution for converting the angle measure. So within the teaching experiment, within the teaching sessions, we hadn't addressed angle conversion yet. We hadn't come up with a formula or worked on that. Uh, so what, we did, well, what I was really interested in was, well, how do you come up with that angle measure conversion? So I asked him, OK, with that first ratio, how did you come up with that? So his response to that was, well, what you're doing is finding a percentage. Like 35 over 360 is, and he calculates it, 9.7% of the full circumference. Because 360 degrees in a circle, so 35 of those degrees equals 9.7% of the full thing. So then all I have to do is find 9.7% of 2 pi, and you'll have that. So again, we see that this idea of angle measure as a fraction of a circle circumference, the student was able to apply it to both units of measure and create an angle measure uh, conversion straight from that line of reasoning, which actually ended up being the case with most of the students in the study that this was the way they ended up coming up with angle measure conversions. And uh, not once did they actually try to say, oh, what's the conversion formula? You know, is it pi over 180? Is it, you know, 180 over pi? They actually used this predominantly as they were working through the rest of the task to say, hey, when I need to convert angle measures, I'm just going to use this idea and go through that. So that became a very powerful idea for them. Some other outcomes. So the students, within the teaching sessions, I also didn't give the typical formalization of you know, R, F, A, and S, that the formula that we typically give them. So I was really interested to see if the student could come up with this. Uh, so for this task, all I gave the student was the diagram that was there, R, F, A, and S, and just said, can you come up with a relationship between each of these variables? Uh, and the one student, I'm going to present the quotes here, first came up with R, F, A, equals S. So that was the first solution he gave, to which his response was, all right, we'll say this is as he's creating R theta equals S. We'll say theta equals radians. Very, very simple then. R theta is equal to S. Because theta is in radians, that means the percentage of the radius, which is then equal to this length, he traced the arc length. So you multiply the percentage of the radius, which he has called theta, by the radius, and you'll get the arc length. So we've seen, we again see him leveraging this quantitative relationship between the arc length and the radius to come up with a formula that we hadn't uh, generalized within the class yet. Uh, and then I was kind of interested, well, what about the common, you know, theta equals s over r? That's another one that we often present to students. So I kind of gave them that formula and said, well, how does this one make sense? And what I expected them to do was divide the previous formula by r and say, you know, hey, we can do that and we get what we wanted. But what was interesting was he didn't even look at his previous formula. And he said, well, this is, and he kind of paused, and he's, and he's pointing to s. He said, well, well, we can look at s as a percentage of the radius length over a radius. It's a ratio. So the ratio will give you a percentage of R. Uh, so again, we see him leveraging this idea of radian angle measure as a measurement relative to the radius and using the radius as a unit uh, to kind of justify the formula rather than using some calculational description or using the previous formula to come up with it. Uh, so this way of reason, him conceptualizing the radius as a unit that could be used to measure other quantities uh, became very powerful for him uh, when it came to angle measure. OK, so now that's enough about angle measure. Right? I think everybody probably came to hear a little about trig functions as well. Uh, so I'm going to speak a little bit on moving into trig functions. So moving into trig functions, I kind of wanted to keep a similar uh, atmosphere about moving into trig functions and kind of draw on their different ways of reasoning with an angle measure to come up with that. Uh, so now the common approach to right triangle or to trigonometry is through right triangles. So I'd say it's a predominant approach if you look at most textbooks. You know. 
A lot of times the justification is given is that ratios are more apparent. Uh, we have Sokato with the work with, you know, it's a mnemonic that students can use to kind of uh, create equations and solve for uh, sides. Uh, but of course, as Brousseau's talked about, this really contradicts kind of the historical development of trigonometry, you know, that over 2,000 years, it wasn't about this. Uh, it was about arcs, which is what, and segments, which is what about angle measure was about. So I really want to try to give something that honored that. So I started off developing trigonometric functions by modeling circular motion. Uh, where the goals in this was really I wanted to one leverage their arc length images of angle measure. I wanted to give them a chance to uh, use those to come up with the trig functions. Also, I wanted them to use the radius as a unit measure to generate the unit circles. So as I gave them circles of different radii, say 3.1 feet, I wanted them to say, well, I can call this 3.1 feet 1 and use that as my unit to measure everything. So I wanted to give them that opportunity to make that connection. And I wanted them to use rate of change reasoning to construct a sine function. Uh, rate of change reasoning has been shown central to pre-calculus and calculus throughout the math research out there. So I wanted to root, try to root the sine function in that sort of thinking. Uh, so I'm going to kind of cheat and skip forward. The, the construction of the sine function, the, the students I work typically occurs with or over about a time period of an hour and 15 minutes, uh, the manner I go about it. So a little too much to kind of present on all the different intricacies that go on during that. But I would kind of present an outcome uh, that was done immediately after the construction of the sign function. So the pro following problem was given to a student right after we've only constructed the sign function. So starting at like the 3 o'clock position, moving counterclockwise, and uh, just measuring you know, a vertical distance from the origin. That's all the student had done at this point. And I asked them to now consider a Ferris wheel of 36 feet and someone boarding the Ferris wheel at the bottom. And I wanted them to then also track with the distance traveled around the path of the Ferris wheel, the vertical distance from the boarding position, so the bottom of the Ferris wheel and not from the middle of the Ferris wheel, which would be the standard sign function. So the student was given a different starting position and a different vertical distance to have to deal with uh, after only being introduced to the sign function. Uh, and I'll kind of give a, ca a little caveat here too. The student that I'm talking about here was only a low B student within this class. So uh, I'm not quite using, you know, the superb A student that's already taken calculus and is in pre-calc for whatever reason. But we'll take a look at uh, his response here. So the first thing he did was he went about trying to make a graph to model the motion. And rather than starting with just drawing a graph, who am I out of time already? Ooh, I totally lost track of time. Uh, okay, I'll wrap this up as quick as possible. I'll try to leave. Uh, if anybody wants to start in with questions, we can do that too. But I'll try to wrap this up in about three minutes here. So basically what the student started doing was he took a look at the arc length here and broke it into equal segments and said, well, the vertical distance is increasing at an increasing rate. And he kind of showed that by saying, well, if I move in one location, move in another, I get bigger changes somewhere else. And from that, he went and said, well, and there's the fill-up diagram, well, and he went and drew the graph based on that. So he did it for the entire circle, then drew the graph to come up with the concavity. So that was pretty powerful that he used arc length to do that. Then what was interesting was he was creating the formula. So again, sorry if this is quick. He started with saying, well, I need the arc length measured in radians and from the 3 o'clock position. So he said, well, I find the distance from the 3 o'clock position, divide by the radius. Then he kind of went through and said, well, I need a vertical distance, but I need it measured in feet, so I have to multiply by 36. So he group of the sign is outputting a, a measurement in uh, radii. So I got to multiply by 36. But then I have to add a radius to that because I'm starting at the bottom. So I got to take care of that. I add a radius to that and he said add 36. So he kind of went about using ideas of measuring in radii to come up with the formula. And so what was beautiful about that is when we moved into right triangles, I kind of gave him a, prob a, pr a standard right triangle problem and asked him to spontaneously come up with whatever he wanted. Uh, so we hadn't done anything in right triangles yet. So what he did with right triangles then was, well, I'm going to draw within the circle. I'm going to use the, the, rate, the hypotenuse of the, of the uh, right triangle as a circle, uh, as the radius of a circle, and then I'm going to measure the legs of the right triangle in terms of the radius. And he was actually very explicit about that and mentioned that, hey, I can, you know, I used to think the hypotenuse was just the side of a triangle, but I can now look at it and look at it like a a radius and measure things relative to the radius and that will simplify my circle. So it was really interesting that this was spontaneous from the student uh, without any probing from me that I said, hey, solve this problem and he spontaneously implemented that and had an explicit awareness that, hey, this was powerful uh, for him. 
Uh, and this is actually a pretty common occurrence with the students in the study. So I guess I'll kind of end things there and kind of summarize real quick. So the key ideas were arc length, images of angle measure, really supported them with the sign, with creating the sine function as a function and coming up with the graph of the function. Uh, and measuring about then also as the radius as a unit of measure was really, really powerful for them. Once they became explicitly aware of that, that really created, created a foundation that they could apply the sine and cosine functions to any context that they wanted. They understood that these, these functions outputted a number of radii, and so then they were able to basically look at the amplitude of the sine function as a conversion to another unit. So if my radius is 36 feet, well, I multiply a number of radii by 36 feet to convert that to a number of feet. Uh, and that's actually shown to be a very difficult thing for the pre-service teachers that I've been working with, that their unit, con thinking of unit conversions for them has been often based in unit cancellation. So match up the unit, strike them out, and what that's done to the pre-service teachers I'm working with, and I'm actually studying at the moment, it's really making them struggle tying the unit circle to a circle of any radius. Uh, they kind of have the unit circle as something that's independent of any circle they're working with uh, because they're not quite yet conceptualizing, okay, I can look at this length, the radius, no matter what circle I'm looking at, I can call that a unit and go from there. Uh, so that's one of the things I'm looking at right now with pre-service teachers, as well as I'm looking into polar coordinates and this idea of radiant measure is becoming a very strong foundation for the pre-service teachers within polar coordinates as well. Uh, so that's kind of another interesting application for that. Uh, so unfortunately, I guess I'll end it there and kind of open it up for questions. Uh, I've got through most of the data, I want, all the data I want to present it. Uh, so we'll go ahead and open up for questions. You can use the chat window or I don't know if Maria wanted people to chime in through their own microphones. Uh, Usually I'll be happy to answer. Put it in the chat window, that seems to work the best. But um, if somebody does have a question, they'd like to use a mic on, they can raise their hand and we can try giving them the mic. Uh, so how much time do I give my students to work through these activities? So typically, uh, here I work on a hour and 15 minute period. Uh, and this pre-calc goes in pre-service teachers. I'll typically have two days worth of angle measure. So reconceptualizing degree measure, then moving into radian measure. Then from there, the sine function and cosine function is about a day and a half of hour and 15 minute periods. Um, so all in all, for those activities, I typically give them four, you know, four hour and 15 minute periods to really work through uh, through those those activities. Uh, so a lot of times I hear, you know, that's a lot of time, you know. But what's interesting is it totally pays off whenever we move in the right triangle trick. That typically is half of a day that they make the connection right away and say, oh, this makes total sense. And I can give them the typical right triangle problems, and they'll have no no problem uh, moving that into uh, making connections there. So that's typically my experience, how long it takes. Well, you guys think about whether you've got any more questions. Let me just wrap a couple of things up here. Um, I just wanted to remind you that the webinars are sponsored by AMATIC. And if you're interested in joining AMATIC, the link is um, up there. It's just amatic.org. And Amatic does also have a Facebook page, and if you follow that page, you can get announcements about Amatic stuff, even if you're not a member, um, including webinars like this one, which I was open to non-members in the last week before the webinar. Um, all of our past Amatic webinars are recorded, and they can be found at this link, um, which to make it easy to remember is just a bit.ly link at Amatic webinars. So if you want to see any of the past webinars, you can go there. Sometimes it takes us as much as a week or two to produce it. It's got to go through three steps. So it just sits in people's boxes for a little while between steps. And then finally, um, if you would take a, a few minutes to evaluate uh, this webinar, it won't take you very long. Um, we'll, we take your feedback on um, what other kinds of webinars you'd like to have. And if you need an email confirmation of your participation, that's uh, we can do that at the end of the evaluation. So that's our uh, carrot for uh, <laughs> filling it out. Um, again, I want to thank Kevin for um, the webinar today. I think it was very interesting to see how students process um, radiant measures based on how they learn, how they learn it. Um, and if there are any other questions from participants, um, please uh, pitch in. Otherwise, um, thanks again so much for, for doing this today. And thank you for everyone for coming. I know from experience it's hard to talk about, especially your dissertation work, in a fixed time period. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. I haven't managed to do it in under Very an hour yet. <laughs>
So tough. And now when you're adding data to it, it just gets, yeah. <laughs> Seems to get thicker and thicker every time. <laughs> Is that um, link working okay for everybody for the evaluation? I'm going to assume yes, since I haven't heard it otherwise. It didn't work for you. All right, let me give oh. you a different link and see if the... Um, See if that one works for you, Julie. Sometimes the bitlies don't work for some reason in here. Ted, does that one work for you too? Okay, great. Cool. Well, um, I'm going to call it a day then. End of the day on, uh, what day is today? Wednesday here on the East Coast. <laughs> Just starting the day in, over there in California, I'm sure. <laughs> Thanks again, everyone. And I'm going to go ahead and end the meeting.